To serve and protect, words we associate with the badge and that iconic blue uniform. But what happens when the people who swear to protect you end up committing horrific crimes? The next five people once upheld the badge, yet somewhere along the way they abandoned their sense of duty and instead of serving and protecting, they ended up killing, murdering, torturing, earning them the distinction as the five most evil cops. Number five, Antoinette Frank. Our story begins with a little girl who dreamed of becoming a cop, and she did. But instead of earning medals, she instead earned the distinction of being one of only two women currently sitting on death row in Louisiana. Her name is Antoinette Frank. How did a once innocent young girl turn into a violent and calculating criminal? Frank had a troubled past. Her brother was a fugitive while her father wandered in and out of her life. Despite her struggles, she filed an application to become an officer at the New Orleans Police Department in 1993 at the age of 24. Frank lied in parts of her application and failed two psychiatric tests. However, not even three weeks later, the police department hired her anyway. This oversight would prove costly as two innocent young people and another police officer would pay for it with their lives. On March 4, 1995, about 2 a.m. Saturday morning, Frank and her accomplice, Roger LaCaze, an 18-year-old alleged drug dealer from whom Frank was involved with, entered the Kim An restaurant using a key she had stolen earlier that night. There were six people inside, the four children of the restaurant owners who were in their late teens and early 20s, another employee, and Officer Randall Williams, the night security guard. At gunpoint, Frank pushed two of the kids and the employee towards the kitchen while Roger slipped behind Williams and shot him once, severing his spine, before shooting him again in the head and back. Williams was a new father, having had his second son, Patrick, just 10 days before. As Frank searched for money she believed was hidden in the back, the employee and two of the kids managed to hide themselves inside a walk-in cooler. The three huddled together in the cold as they heard more gunshots from outside as Frank executed the two children left exposed in the kitchen. Frank and Lacaze found the money and left, and she dropped him off at his house. After hearing the 911 call on her dispatch, she rushed to the scene knowing witnesses were left behind, and despite trying to cover her tracks, it was game over for Frank. For the three innocent lives taken, Frank is currently sitting on death row while Lacaze will receive a new trial because of a technicality. Number four, Manuel Pardo. The next cop on the list knew full well what he was doing. Dubbed as the real Dexter Morgan, Manuel Pardo was unremorseful of his crimes and as methodical with his trophies as the television serial killer. Pardo had an impressive resume. He was a former Boy Scout and Navy veteran. He joined the Florida Highway Patrol in the 70s, even finishing at the top of his class. However, he was hiding a disturbed psyche, which showed through in the cracks. Pardo was working in the police department in Sweetwater, a small, quiet town in Miami-Dade County. After four years and an assault charge, he was fired when he went to the Bahamas to testify for a colleague and was found to have lied in court. These incidents, however, were minor when compared to what Pardo would do next. In 1986, something snapped, and Pardo went on a 92-day killing spree. In total, he killed six men and three women in the name of getting rid of vermin. Perhaps the most disturbing thing about this is that Pardo did not show any remorse for his actions. As he stated, all nine victims were drug dealers and deserved to die. Manuel Pardo was killed by lethal injection on December 11, 2012. Number three, Craig Payer. Craig Payer secures a slot in infamy as the only California Highway Patrol officer to be convicted of murder while on active duty. Two days after Christmas, off the Mercy Road exit ramp at Interstate 15, the body of 20-year-old Cara Knott was found. Her face had been bludgeoned and she had been strangled. No one knows for sure what happened on the night of December 27, 1986. It is believed Payer followed Kara after seeing her at a Chevron station while she was on her way home. He followed her for 10 miles before signaling her to pull over 
and directed her to the secluded Mercy Road exit ramp. It was here Knott became uncomfortable and tried to get away. Payer then backhanded Knott using his police flashlight, causing the injury to her temple and face while knocking her unconscious. Realizing that Knott would be able to identify him, Payer took out a rope from his car and proceeded to strangle her before transporting her to a bridge nearby. He then lifted her lifeless body up and threw her 60 feet down onto a dry creek bed. In a flash of irony, two days after the murder happened, Payer appeared on a ride-along interview where he gave advice to female drivers about protection and safety. Being a female, you could be raped, robbed if you're a male. This also proved to be his downfall as the calls started pouring in of women in similar age and looks as Kara, saying that Officer Payer, the man in the video, had stopped them on the same ramp. While most insisted he was not violent, they said he made them feel uncomfortable and some even complained Payer had made sexual advances. The story of the 13-year veteran patrolman had started to crumble after forensic evidence, notably a distinctive gold fiber from his police patch, was found in Kara Knott's body. 21 days after Kara's body was found under the bridge, Greg Payer would be arrested for the murder. Currently, Payer sits in jail serving his 25 years to life sentence. He has tried twice to apply for parole, in 2008 and 2012, both were denied. He will be eligible again in 2027. Up to this day, Payer maintains his innocence, but refuses to provide a DNA sample to possibly exonerate him, if he is indeed innocent as he claims. Number two, Gerard John Schaefer. Gerard John Schaefer gained notoriety as being one of the most disturbed killers of all time. His story begins at Stewart, Florida on July 21st, 1972, when 18-year-old Pamela Sue Wells and 17-year-old Nancy Ellen Trotter thumbed for a ride. It was there they met Deputy Sheriff Gerard Schaefer, a friendly man in uniform who gave the girls a ride back to their halfway house and invited them to a nearby beach the next day. But instead of a beach, Schaefer drove the girls to Hutchinson Island a swampy patch off State Road A1A. Schaefer brandished a gun, gagged and handcuffed the girls, tying a noose around their heads and leaving them to balance on slippery tree roots while he went on a police call. One slip and the noose could kill them. The girls, however, managed to escape. They were considered the lucky ones. While Schaefer was charged for aggravated assault and false imprisonment, he would set a $15,000 bond and be left to hunt again. His next victims would not be so lucky. 17-year-old Susan Place and 16-year-old Georgia Jessup would disappear on September 27, 1972. Their disappearance and eventual remains would be the nail in the coffin on Schaefer's reign of terror. Investigations of their deaths would lead detectives to Schaefer's mother's house, where he once lived and kept a spare bedroom for personal items. What they found inside would provide a clue to Schaefer's elaborate portfolio as a killer, even before he donned the uniform. Newspaper clippings, jewelry, and personal belongings, including a tooth of the victims, as well as hundreds of pages of writings and sketches depicting mutilations, rape, and murder of young women were discovered. This discovery would link him to several other cases including the disappearance of a childhood friend, Lee Hainlein. By this time, he was believed to have killed at least nine people, but some investigators suspect he was responsible for killing more than 30 women. Schaefer, however, would only be tried and sentenced to two terms of life for the murder of Susan Place and Georgia Jessup. Although Place and Jessup weren't his last victims, Schaefer, the friendly man in the uniform, would remain in jail for his crimes up until his death, ironically, by murder in 1995. Number one, Daniel Holtzclaw. Daniel Holtzclaw may not have butchered or killed anybody, but he earns the distinction of being the most evil cop there is. A former member of the Oklahoma City Police Department, Holtzclaw was once a linebacker for Eastern Michigan University. He unsuccessfully went after the NFL and became a police officer instead. 
What makes his case so disturbing was that he was calculating in his crimes. He would pick his victims from the same poor black neighborhood, knowing full well his position as a cop would be viewed as authority. He also knew that even if his victims spoke up, their credibility would be questioned. All of his victims were women of color, most of whom had previous criminal records and ranged from the ages of 17, the youngest, to over 50 years old. Holtzclaw's modus operandi was to run a background check against the women, picking the ones with warrants and outstanding criminal records, then blackmailing and coercing them to perform sexual acts. On June 18, 2014, he made a serious mistake by pulling a traffic stop on 57-year-old Janie Legions. She was not from the same neighborhood and profile he targeted. The officer forced her to perform oral sex despite her begging him to stop. After the incident, Legion filed a police report and Holtzclaw was arrested on the same day. Investigations began and detectives were able to bring 13 women to testify against Holtzclaw. In court, he was charged with 36 counts, including sexual battery, assault, stalking, and coercive oral sodomy. On December 10, 2015, he was found guilty on 18 counts, and he will now be serving a consecutive 263-year jail sentence as a result. So that was five of the most evil cops to ever wear a badge. While we may never understand why they did what they did, one thing to remember is that despite wearing that blue uniform, none of these people were above the law. Let us know what you think of these psychos in the comments below. And if you want more scary mysteries to come your way each week, remember to subscribe to our channel and thanks for tuning in.